I think eGUI might actually be one of the most requested GUI frameworks that comes up anytime I talk about something that runs on the web, anytime that I deal with something that talks about UI and Bevy, anytime I talk about UI and native applications, someone always comes up with, hey, what about eGUI? And there is a reason for that. While personally, most of my UI experience historically has been on the web, for example, the web doesn't embed well everywhere, right? You still need a browser to be able to view something. eGUI takes a slightly different approach. Yes, eGUI can render to the web, but the web isn't necessarily its primary platform. eGUI tends to function really well when integrated with, say, Bevy. So what is eGUI? eGUI is described in the README as a simple, fast, and highly portable immediate mode GUI library for Rust. eGUI runs on the web, natively, and in your favorite game engine, which is a link to a large list of targets that you can have if you build an eGUI app. There are the sort of official integrations, such as eFrame, which is the one that we'll probably be looking at the most today. Then there's third-party integrations, such as Bevy eGUI, or eGUI for a number of different rendering engines, including eGUI for Nanu, which we've also talked about on the channel before. eGUI is designed to be integrated with things. So it's no surprise that writing your own eGUI integration is right here in the readme. Because not only being the easiest to use Rust GUI library, one of eGUI's targets is that you can use eGUI anywhere you can draw textured triangles. Now, textured triangles should set off sparks in your head if you've been following any of the shader videos that I've been doing. Because textured triangles are something that we deal with a lot on the GPU. So there's a focus on being easy to use and being simple, which in contrast to the web itself, the web itself is not necessarily simple. And it's not specifically simple in the way that eGUI means simple, which isn't just simple to understand, but also portable and embeddable. eGUI does run on the web though, and you can see that in the example here, which is running in the Arc browser. We've got widgets and windows and things we can click and drag. We've got radio buttons and state and checkboxes and links that we can click. We've even got date pickers, which are notoriously complicated to implement in the land of UI. There's graph plotting and custom widgets, which we'll cover in a second. Components that you might expect, such as color pickers or progress bars. We can click and drag as an interaction pattern to change values. We have drop-down menus and combo boxes. So there's plenty of different components that we can use to build up an interface. That said, I'm trying to right-click right now and I can't. So if I go up to the top bar menu and I open the developer tools, we can see that, or maybe you can't because it's not zoomed in far enough. Now, hopefully you can see that this entire UI is built inside of a canvas element. So when we render eGUI to the web, we are giving up on the accessibility that we get by default with native HTML elements, as well as things like CSS, etc. This is a GUI framework that renders to sort of GPU textures. And that doesn't mean we don't get things like keyboard access. For example, if I start hitting tab, you can see the selection move across first the top and then the right hand side. It's important to note that eGUI has recently integrated access kit as of 0 0.20. Now that doesn't mean it's fully integrated. It doesn't mean that that's the most accessible GUI framework available, but it is integrated and there are things if we check out the back end, like this experimental screen reader feature. So while we do lose some of the native accessibility components of rendering on the web, there is work being done to sort of grab those back. And if you run eGUI on desktops, Access Kit actually does integrate with desktop level APIs for these accessibility concerns. There are different modes that you can run eGUI in. For example, right now, if, since we're looking at the background debug stats, we're in reactive mode, which if I move the mouse cursor, you can see that we get total frames painted increasing. And if I stop moving the mouse, the total frames painted stays relatively stable. If we go to continuous, it just keeps rendering everything over and over. eGUI has the ability to render complex components like tables, for example. Here's an example that renders a bunch of control points that lets you draw a Bezier curve. We can even do things like set up syntax highlighting in text components with different themes, light themes, dark themes, setting the colors of individual elements. We can implement our own context menus with right click and complex interactions like drag and drop are a thing that also work as well. Basically, if you need to build a UI with eGUI, you should have a fair amount of confidence now that you can build that UI with eGUI. That said, 
for example, I'm on dribble on the right here. If I do say a search for UI, for example, we're going to get a lot of beautifully defined UI elements, whether those are headers or elements on a phone or elements on a website, for example, like this. Getting eGUI to look the way you want is going to take more work, I think, than it would take on the web. And I think this is generally true of all native desktop UI toolkits. So eGUI is not alone here, but eGUI being built on top of the GPU has access to quite a bit of power. And the way that I use eGUI the most is often with Bevy Inspector eGUI, which uses the reflect traits that Bevy provides to expose different entities' components and their values in an inspector for you if you want a quick debug interface inside of your Bevy application or game. This is one example of a time when you don't necessarily need a marketing site level of design, for example. You just need something that can work inside of a developer environment. And eGUI is really good at this. So then it's useful to look at the goals of the eGUI project. We've gone over a couple of them already, but it's nice to see that there's a list here for where to place eGUI compared to other sort of ecosystem approaches, right? When would I use eGUI over Leptos or U or something like that? So we're looking for the easiest to use GUI library. This I think is incredibly important when the GUI is not the most important thing that you're building. For example, like we just looked at with Bevy Inspector eGUI, we want the debug interface and we care about say writing shaders or building our game, not about building a GUI to interact with the game. It targets 60 Hertz. Now, I believe that we're only looking at one to two milliseconds to paint a frame in eGUI in general, with the possibility of even more optimization in the future. So if you think about the frame budgets that we have on the web, for example, we're looking at 16 milliseconds. One to two milliseconds to do those paints is not that big of a deal. So we've got easy to use, friendly, portable, easy to integrate, and you can see a theme developing here. It's, it's supposed to be easy, it's supposed to be simple, it's supposed to be something you can reach for and then work on later, right? And going back to sort of the way things look by default, a native looking interface is not one of eGUI's goals. So if you're looking for something that looks like a Mac OS app on Mac or iOS device or something like that, eGUI may not be the thing that you wanna use. And if your layouts get too advanced or too flexible, you may be looking at needing the web platform or something like that, that can support your needs rather than eGUI, who explicitly has a non-goal to be too powerful or too complex or too flexible. And I think this does really impact the library in a positive way. So when should you use eGUI? The authors say that it aims to be the best choice when you want a simple way to create a GUI as we've gone over already, or when you wanna add a GUI to a game engine, such as Bevy Inspector eGUI. If you're not using Rust, don't use eGUI. If you want native UI, don't use eGUI. If you want something that doesn't break when you upgrade it, don't use eGUI because eGUI still hasn't hit 1.0. I think we're at version 0.20 as of the recording of this video. So reach for eGUI when you're writing something that's interactive in Rust that needs a simple GUI. This makes eGUI really good for building a quick GUI on top of some procedural generation in Bevy, for example. One use case that I'm planning on using eGUI for in the near future is for admin tools for a software as a service platform that I'm working on. So instead of spending a bunch of time building a web interface to my database, I'm going to try to use eGUI to build out those admin tools so I can focus less on the actual interface and more on building the product. And because that UI is going to be an admin interface, the only people that are going to see it are me or other people that I give admin access. And it is important also to notice that you can customize the look of eGUI, for example, here with this tiny Pomodoro timer. It just might take more effort than you expect coming from other ecosystems. So here's an example of building a custom component that replicates a toggle interface. You can see that there's four steps here for a given custom widget, some of which may be more effort than you're used to in other ecosystems. We have to decide a size for the widget. We have to allocate the space for it. We have to handle any inter interactions that would occur and we have to paint the widget. So first we have to decide the widget size, right? And just before we continue, I have the demo app running on the right hand side here. We are building this custom widget right here. This is the toggle button. Now in the demo, it says this toggle switch is just 15 lines of code, but I'm not sure where they got that from. 
I think they might just be talking about this toggle UI function. So step one, decide the widget size. UI here is a mutable reference to the eGUI UI. We get the spacing, the interact size times Y, and we multiply it by a VEC2 of two and one. So we're scaling the spacing basically. We need to allocate that size on the screen. So we can use the UI allocate exact size with the desired size that we just created. And we include the fact that we wanna be able to detect clicks. So we wanna be able to, when we click that toggle button, switch it back and forth. That gives us a rectangle and this mutable reference to a response variable. And because this is immediate mode, we can just detect immediately whether response was clicked or not. And because we've specified on in our function arguments as a mutable Boolean, we can set on to, because this is a toggle button, either true or false, depending on whether it is currently true or false. And then we have to mark that data as changed. Here we're defining some accessibility data for screen readers, defining this as a checkbox with the on state. And then finally, we need to actually paint it to the screen. So if the rectangle that we're going to draw this inside of is visible, then we're going to ask the eGUI UI to animate a Boolean between zero and one for how on it is. If we click this, you can see that it animates back and forth and that's that zero to one value animating back and forth. We've seen some support for theming. So we grab the style that we want based on whether the current rectangle is actually hovered or not, for example. And that gives us access to some visuals, which you can see as BG stroke or BG fill or foreground stroke. The coordinates that we need to actually draw into are absolute screen space coordinates. So we do need to use rect, which comes from this allocate exact size on the screen to actually get the place that we're going to put this. We can calculate the radius of the circle. Again, this circle is the toggle. We can calculate the radius, which is half the height, by doing half the height of that rectangle that we've allocated. We grab the painter and we draw the rectangle with the rect that we were given, the radius, the background fill, and the background stroke. We can determine where in the toggle the circle that we're drawing should be by lerping, which is a function that you should be familiar with from the shader work, from the left-hand side to the right-hand side of the rectangle. And this is where we use our zero to one value based on how on it is. So we're animating the off to on value from zero to one over a period of time. We calculate the center of where the circle should be based on that X value that we're animating, as well as the center of the Y value of the rectangle. And then we use the painter to draw a circle at that location with the appropriate values. And finally, we return the response. And that's how you build out a custom sort of widget or component or whatever you want to call it inside of eGUI. So I hope this gave you some insight into what eGUI is. It's a very commonly requested video and the place that it occupies in my mind is the place that they intend it to occupy uh, when described in the readme. It's for quick, simple GUIs that I don't really care about the visuals for. I just need something so that I can interact with the thing that I'm actually working on. And this means it's really good for things like embedding inside of Bevy, but it's less good for building web apps with the expectations that modern users have. It's also not as good for end user desktop apps because end users, people who aren't developers often expect say a Mac OS app to look like a Mac OS app on Mac OS. And that is explicitly a non-goal for eGUI. So I really like eGUI. I do use it. It has a place in my toolkit. It is not my default GUI choice. I often build for the web. So I use web tooling more often than not, but I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you tomorrow in the next one. Have a great rest of your day.